Amy Goodman, thanks for taking the time to sit down with us. Oh, it's so great to be with you, Sarah. You're on a very busy 100 cities <laughs> tour right now. Yes, uh, it, but I know I'm in New Mexico right now. Your new book, Democracy Now!, 20 years covering the movements, changing America, opens with your reflections on covering um, the elections in Haiti in 1995 and preparing for the 1996 presidential elections here in the U.S. What do you think elections can tell us about the state of our country, the state of our democracy? Well, I think what's critical is people need to be able to participate. I mean, when I was in Haiti, people faced enormous violence. Both the politicians could be gunned down, people going to the polls, yet the vast majority of people voted. In this country, I mean, at that time, I mean, if half the people voted, we were lucky. Now that's unacceptable. In these primaries and caucuses, while there's a great deal made of who's coming out for who, what really is the overwhelmingly significant number is that 80% of people are not voting. And that goes to the issue, I think, of voter obstacles. It is unacceptable in this country that the Voting Rights Act is being eviscerated. I mean, in Texas, you can't, you have to show an ID, but it cannot be a student ID, though you can show a gun license. Uh, what does that say about this country? People who have in any way had a brush with the criminal justice system. It is a big untold story. Millions of people cannot vote in this country, um, perhaps because they serve time in jail. In some states, you can never vote again. In other states, like Vermont and Maine, prisoners can vote from jail. Um, we need to open up access. We just had a primary in Arizona. There were 200 polling places last time in Phoenix, large Latino population. Now 140 of them were closed. How could this be? The rationale was given to save money. Well, then why open any polling places? You could save everything. But no, you endanger democracy. Do you attribute that to the Supreme Court decision on the Voting Rights Act in 2013? Oh, I mean, there's no question that the fact that a number of states are no longer under um, scrutiny is a major problem. Um, we need to increase voter participation. We need to, uh, for example, in many states, Election Day is a holiday um, or it's on a weekend. Here in the United States, it's difficult. If you have a situation like you had in Arizona where it takes five hours to vote and you are working that day, you gotta leave. You don't have time to vote. Um, we have to make it possible that all eligible voters can vote in this country. That makes a democracy meaningful. How are you covering the 2016 elections differently compared we, to other media? We focus on movements. It is so important because movements matter, movements make history. I mean, the disproportionate coverage of Donald Trump, no matter who you support, including Donald Trump. Uh, the Tyndall Report showed in 2015, he got 23 times the coverage of Bernie Sanders. I think ABC World News Tonight gave him 81 minutes. Sanders got 20 seconds. I wonder what Sanders did for that 20 seconds uh, in the spotlight. Uh, you look at March 15th, that was one primary night. They called it Super Tuesday 3. It was Missouri, Illinois. It was Ohio, Florida, and North Carolina. Um, they played that night of the corporate networks. Um, they brought you Marco Rubio's speech. He pulled out because he didn't win Florida. Uh, John Kasich's speech. Uh, he won his first primary that night, his home state of Ohio. Hillary Clinton had won three states by then. It was Ohio and Florida and North Carolina. By the time she spoke, then they waited and waited and waited for Trump. They showed the empty podium in one of his Florida mansions. Um, and the pundits were all filling the time. You know, the pundits that you get on these corporate networks who know so little about so much, explaining the world to us and getting it so wrong. Finally, Donald Trump spoke. Okay, Ted Cruz spoke. They played what he said. Where was Bernie Sanders that night? Had he fallen asleep? Had he taken the night off? Why weren't even any of the networks speculating? I mean, I'm talking Fox, MSNBC, CNN. He had just disappeared. There's something worse than negative coverage. It's when you vanish someone. The next morning on Democracy Now!, we played an excerpt of Bernie Sanders' speech. Yes, he spoke before thousands of people in Phoenix, Arizona. Who would have thought it would be a revolutionary act to play the speech of a major party presidential candidate on the night or the morning after a major series of primaries? 
It is unacceptable what has happened in this country, even though he has broken many records from fundraising, $44 million in March versus Hillary Clinton's $29 million, the number of donors well over $6 million. It's not about who you're for and who you're against. The networks have to be fair in their coverage. And one more thing, I call for an electoral season without polls. I know that sounds extreme, but think about it. Why are polls so important? I mean, when I'm trying to make my decision, do I care what you think or my family thinks? Um, I want to know what the issues are that the candidates think are important, what their records are. Uh, the way the networks do it, it's sort of like, um, it makes it look like a horse race, right? This one's ahead, this one's behind. And then you come to the day of the primary and the polls are wrong. And so they spend the next period of time talking about how they got it so wrong. What the networks need to do is spend the same millions of dollars, not on polls, but on investigating records and the policies of presidential candidates. Um, and the fact of the matter is we have polls. Primaries and caucuses are natural polls. At the end of the day, these are fact-based. They're not speculation. You find out the demographics of the voters. You find out um, the racial breakdown, age breakdown, all of the things that are important. But why not base it in fact? The polls that we are inundated with should just stop. You were arrested at the 2008 Republican National Convention in St. Paul. Other journalists have been arrested this year at Donald Trump rallies. Why does that concern you? Oh, I am gravely concerned about this. It was not just me. Um, <clears throat> I was arrested uh, in 2012, the first day of the Republican convention uh, in St. Paul. We had been covering the peace protests outside, 10,000 people led by soldiers who had been in Iraq and Afghanistan. And then I went to the convention floor and was interviewing delegates from the hottest state. At that time, it was Alaska, right? That was the John McCain, Sarah Palin convention. And then I got a call that two of my colleagues at Democracy Now!, Sharif abdel Qadus and Nicole Salazar, had been arrested and bloodied by the police. I said, what are you talking about? They're in the TV station digitizing tape. And my colleague, Mike Burke, said, no, come quickly to 7th and Jackson in St. Paul. They were covering a protest that had broken out in the afternoon, and they were arrested. Now, I simply went to that corner to get my colleagues released. I was responsible for them raced to the corner. I saw the riot police lined up. They'd fully contained the area. I went up to one of the riot police officers and I said, excuse me, we need to have our reporters released. It wasn't seconds before he ripped me through the police line, twisted my arms back, slapped handcuffs on. And as I said, please, sir, I just wanted to speak to your commanding officer. Don't arrest me. He, they pushed me to the ground um, and they charged me with a misdemeanor, misdemeanor, interfering with a peace officer if only there was a peace officer in the vicinity. Now, ultimately, because we were arrested, there was a tremendous amount of pressure brought on the St. Paul, Minneapolis police, all the authorities, they got thousands of calls, emails, tweets, every different form of communication. So after a number of hours, I was released and my colleagues were. But you know, I was one of 40 reporters or more who were arrested at that convention in that week. This is unacceptable. But later that night, I was brought back to the convention and I was in the NBC skybox and I was being interviewed. And when the camera was turned off, an NBC reporter came over to me and he said, hey, how come I didn't get arrested? I said, oh, were you out covering the protest too? And he said, no. And I said, oh, well, I don't get arrested in the skybox either, <laughs> right? It's our job to cover the delegates, to get into the corporate suites of the Democratic and Republican conventions who's sponsoring these events, and to go out into the streets where the uninvited guests are. And there are often thousands of them. You know, democracy is a messy thing, and it's our job to capture it all. And we shouldn't have to get a record when we put things on the record. Um, Amy, who were your mentors and people you looked up to in the early years of your career? You've been doing democracy now for 20 years now. Well, I mean, these 20 years have been such an amazing experience. Um, I was a journalist since I was a kid. Um, my parents, my grandparents were wonderful role models, though they weren't involved in journalism, but in living an ethical life. And I saw journalism as a way to look at the world, to also cover the people, the heretics, the whistleblowers, the change makers, the uh, prophets who 
deeply cared about making the world a better place. And that has always inspired me. And I hope in Democracy Now! and so honored here on New Mexico PBS that we broadcast every day, this daily grassroots global news hour, that we provide a forum for people to speak for themselves. When you hear someone speaking from their own experience, whether a Palestinian child or an Israeli grandmother, an Iraqi aunt, an uncle from Afghanistan, a kid from East St. Louis or the South Valley here in Albuquerque, it challenges stereotypes and caricatures that fuel hate groups. I mean, when you hear someone speaking from their own experience, you understand where they're coming from. I didn't say agree. How often do we even agree with our family members? But you understand something about them, makes it much less likely you'll want to hurt them. That's important. That understanding is the beginning of peace. I think the media can be the greatest force for peace on earth. Instead, all too often, it is wielded as a weapon of war, which is why we have to take the media back. Amy, thank you so much for spending some time with us today. Thank you, Sarah.